mode. Hello, everybody. This is Sart or Brian Rowe from LS NTAP. Uh, we've got a great presentation going on here. This is Can I Work Remotely? We're going to get started here at about two minutes after. We've got about a third of the people who are registered um, who are here, and they're slowly uh, trickling in. Um, I just want to remind people that all of the LS NTAP trainings are recorded. Um, there is a link to our YouTube channel at the top of lsntap.org. Our YouTube channel actually just got over 200 uh, training videos up, and we're just over 140,000 hits so far. And we even have people who are starting to uh, make comments over there and ask questions, that type of stuff. So that is a way that you can definitely interact with us. There's a direct link in the chat. Um, to all of our archive trainings for the last three years. Um, we've got a full schedule of trainings uh, this year, and I'm dropping a link to all of the webinars for 2017. We've got, I believe, 33 scheduled at this point. Um, the link that I just sent out uh, has links to the four so far that have been archived, and then it has registration links and dates uh, for every training that we've got coming up for the rest of the year. So definitely recommend checking that out. Register now for some of those and save the uh, spot for them. Uh, if you've got any technical issues, please feel free to use the questions box that's there. Uh, there's also a function to raise your hand in GoToWebinar. If you do that, we will unmute you and you can ask questions of the presenters. Uh, anything that is sent through the question box, uh, myself and uh, Kat will be monitoring. Um, we will read those out to the presenters as they go along. If you've got a question, there's probably another third of the audience that has the same question. So please feel free to ask. In tech and law, we have terrible acronyms. We often assume that people are more aware of things than they may be. Please ask. We want to get that information out to people, correct uh, anything, or help people get the most out of these webinars that they can. Um, we're about two minutes after. One last reminder, we are recording this, and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, I would like to turn it over um, to Anna Steele at this point. Thank you so much for organizing this webinar. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks, Brian. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Anna Steele. I'm a member of the consulting team at Just Tech, and prior to that was working as a technologist in legal services. Uh, so today, I am joined by uh, Kathleen Dwyer, one of my colleagues at Just Tech, Xander Karsten, who's a project manager over at Legal Server, and Allison Paul, who's the executive director at Montana Legal Services Association. And so many of us have extensive experience either working remotely or overseeing remote projects and remote staff. Uh, Kat, Xander, and I are all currently working remotely. Um, so we have a lot of experience in this area and hope to kind of guide everybody in um, how they're going to work on making these decisions going forward. If it's something that you're considering doing or your supervisees have been asking you about it, um, that's what we want to go through today. So um, we'll be addressing working remotely from multiple perspectives this afternoon. Uh, first, we'll be looking at some of the technology decisions that need to be made uh, while preparing to support remote workers. Um, a key component of effective and efficient remote workforce is obviously uh, support from your executive director and management team. Uh, and of course, for those of us who work remotely or are considering doing so, um, there are a number of considerations to take into account when working remotely. Uh, it's more than fuzzy pink slippers and being allowed to have bad hair days, so we really want to kind of put all of that in perspective. So those of you who are supervisors or managers um, on this webinar today have most likely been asked by a staff member if they can work remotely. So while the two easiest answers to this question are, sure, go ahead, or mm -mm, nope, never. Uh, it's important that your organization is prepared to support uh, remote workers from a technological supervision and staffing perspective. Uh, that being said, is it important to work through these decisions now, even if you are not considering working remotely, um, so that you can be well prepared? You don't want to necessarily have to drag it out and be making uh, policy decisions and feeling rushed 
in doing so um, when folks are starting to ask or there is a definite need for them to do so. Uh, saying yes without thinking through some of these technology and policy implementations can put client data at risk, but saying no as a matter of policy can potentially hinder your effectiveness and efficiency of your staff. So one thing to keep in mind as we go through this today is that there are a couple of different approaches to working remotely. You can have a completely remote staff member who works from home or another location. Uh, you can have access to an office space in another location, such as a hospital or a community partner. Uh, you can have attorneys who want to be able to work remotely between court appearances or hearings, or a staff member who just wants to work from home if the weather's bad, or if their kid is sick, or to finish up some work while on vacation. So kind of keep all of those different uh, scenarios in mind as we go through things today. Um, and I will hand it over to my colleague Kat to start looking at some technology considerations. Hey, thanks, Anna. Um, this webinar, as we said, is an overview. It is definitely not meant to be comprehensive uh, by any means, because otherwise we could probably spend literally a, a day or more on this topic. But when you are thinking about working remotely, um, obviously, it, it, the word remote, <laughs> off-site location, um, meaning typically that you are not going to be in a full office setting. So one thing that may seem obvious, but sometimes is not, is that your staff member or you should have an option to connect to high-speed internet. Um, this is often more of a consideration than you would think, especially if you are living in a not so urban or suburban area. Um, in addition, there are some internet providers that will go through, for example, a dish. And while they call that high speed, it is not always the most dependable um, in terms of weather, snow, rain. Very often um, the dish internet can get interrupted. Um, thinking about how to work from a hotspot. Um, is your hotspot always connected? Is it giving you actual high-speed internet? And obviously, high-speed internet is not all, um, it's not always the exact same. For example, if you are doing a webinar like this, you your need for high-speed internet is completely different from if all that you are doing is accessing email, et cetera. So your hotspot may be very different from your cable. Um, connection. Um, communications also, we're talking usually about going through internet. Very few people have a landline anymore. If people say that they have a quote unquote home phone, it's very often through their cable modem um, or through their internet provider. You may be able to use a soft phone, which goes through VOIP as well. So if you are on your soft phone through your internet and you have a child in the other room that is streaming a movie or playing a video game, that may impact your internet speed. So something to consider. Same thing as cell phone. I live in New York City and when I'm out on the street, I get great cell phone reception generally. Many office buildings, especially older office buildings built before the war with a lot of iron and metal in them, very often I do not get great cell phone reception. So you need to consider that. Um, privacy, how are you going to be able to talk to clients? Um, how are you going to be able to talk to um, other staff members uh, without compromising privacy? Also, with having the ability to um, cloister yourself so that you're not inter being interrupted all the time. Um, one thing I neglected to mention with hotspots is also how are you securing those hotspots um, so that other people are not getting onto your hotspot or if you're working on Wi-Fi, are you sure that it is secure? And of course, you need to have access to the proper hardware. Um, if you're using legal server in your office, you're gonna need to have access to legal server on your laptop or whatever your remote um, hardware is. And speaking of hardware, um, we hope that most remote staff would have access to the same hardware or comparable hardware. So if within your office, um, folks are using the best, most up-to-date laptops, we would like you to have the best, most up-to-date laptop. If everyone in the office is using a particular version of Word, we would like you to have the same version. Um, it makes life a lot easier without having to worry about versioning. Um, it also um, affects your ability to work remotely. If you have an old, beat-up laptop 
that the company says, here, this is the loaner, um, but it's impeding your progress of work, that's really obviously not optimal. We're not going to speak much about the organization owns versus BYOD, which stands for bring your own device. Um, but it is definitely a consideration. Um, is the organization going to own the laptop or are you going to use your own laptop or tablet or smartphone, et cetera, et cetera? There can be some very different, uh, I'm sorry, some very big differences in policies. Obviously, if it's a company owned device versus a personally owned device. But regardless of who owns what we are using to work, we need to make sure that we maintain all the hardware, keep it up to date, keep it again to the latest versions or at least the same versions that other staff members are using. Um, already briefly mentioned the occasional remote worker, making sure that there are some devices that can be shared, especially in the event of a disaster or uh, uh, bad weather when someone is not planning to work off-site, or if there is some other reason, compelling reason for someone to work off-site uh, occasionally. And um, again, just making sure that anything that remote workers are doing um, is supported and that everything, we keep a list so that we make sure that everything is getting updated as part of those organizational updates and we don't get forgotten about. So expanding a little bit more on the uh, bring your own device piece, um, if you're going to allow your staff to use their own devices while working remotely, um, you should really work on develop a policy that's outlining um, matters such as what type of device can be used for client-related worker communications, uh, the security of that device, so password policies, should it be encrypted, um, antivirus software, is your IT department responsible for supporting and servicing these personal devices, right? If my uh, laptop stops, my 10-year-old laptop stop, stops working, can I call the IT department for the organization that I work for and say, hey, help me out, right? So you want to kind of uh, outline those expectations. And you want uh, an employee exit strategy. When an employee leaves, how can you ensure that the device is clear of any data um, that they should no longer have access to? Now, this is something that you may want to even start thinking about even if you do not have remote staff or are not supporting remote, remote staff. Because, I mean, the reality is people are using their personal devices for work right, if they're answering emails on the couch after dinner, right, or uh, hooking up their email to their smartphones. So it's definitely something that you want to be thinking of. Uh, so in that respect, um, with mobile device management, so there's a lot of those policies that I just talked about can be built into software when it comes to smartphones and tablets, um, you know, ultimately giving you the ability to wipe the device as a whole or just the organization related data. Um, if the device is lost or stolen if, or if the employee leaves. Um, I know that Google Apps has it built in. Uh, 365 does to a degree, but not um, as extensive as Google Apps. Um, so you just want to be aware, again, of that. Um, and again, like I said, managing expectations, right? So if folks are going to be using their own devices outside of the office, um, does that mean that they can count that as work time, right? When they are answering emails or entering their uh, time for the past day or week. Um, is that something that they can be uh, formally counting that as time worked? So these are these are things that you want to discuss and make sure that are very clear um, if you are going to be working on a, a bring your own device policy. And definitely don't reinvent the wheel on this one. Um, this is something that's getting talked about on LSN tap fairly frequently and people out there definitely do have uh, these bring your own device policies. Um, so definitely see what's out there and uh, have the conversation because um, you're not alone on this one. So you really want to see what other people are doing. And obviously the big one, right, when it comes to uh, working remotely as far as technology considerations go is security, right? Network access is the big one. Uh, staff should have some way to securely access the information that they need in order to do their work efficiently and effectively. Um, if you use Office 365, SharePoint, Google Apps, um, make sure that you have password policies to keep that information secure. 
um, if you do not have a cloud-based solution, uh, set up Windows Remote Desktop Services or a VPN, uh, talk to your tech folks about that, um, or a software application like Log Me In. Right? We really want to prevent people from emailing excessive amounts of client data to themselves over and over and over again, both for security reasons and for um, just versioning, right? keeping track of the proper uh, proper documents. Um, and also, we really want to prevent people from carrying flash drives with client confidential client information. Um, both of those can result in um, the information getting downloaded onto the computer. And even if it is a, a company-owned computer, right, having that laptop out and about, it gets accidentally left on the train, um, things like that, the less, uh, the fewer files that are actually being stored on the device itself, um, the better. So if you do use, just pro tip, and those of you who have worked with me before know that I um, love living in the, the Google Cloud. Um, so if you do use Google Apps, are now called G Suite, um, Chromebooks are a great remote device as there's little to no data that's actually stored on the device. Um, again, it's only as secure as user passwords. So if you're going to utilize Chromebooks uh, or similar devices, ensure that you have strong password policies. Um, so just really when it comes down to security, use common sense, really think about it. And this is one of the big reasons that you don't want to just say yes when somebody asks to work remotely because um, you want to make sure that you really kind of take the security surrounding your client data and the data um, and the personal data about your staff uh, into account. Hi, everyone. So my name is Xander Karsten. I think most of you probably know me. Um, I am a project manager at Legal Server, and prior to that, uh, did um, direct services for about four years and then worked at Pro Bono Net on the Law Help platform for about uh, for almost three years before coming here. Um, so, and this at Legal Server is my first experience working completely remotely. Um, I had had experience working, you know, here and there remote, um, doing some remote work while I traveled or just sort of generally, but this is my first experience not only being completely remote as a staff member, but also being um, remote, but also um, working on a completely remote team. So most of our team, um, you know, works from home, works from some other uh, some other space and uh, and calls in or um, uses other tools to stay connected. The first sort of thing that we wanted to cover under the staff perspective, because because I think it really is the most important part of working remotely as a staff member for me is that uh, effective communication. Uh, before we jump into that, there's this section of the slide deck. You're going to have these really cute little uh, dudes, um, and these are all uh, available um, to anybody for any reason, no attribution needed. Um, and the link is there. So if you ever want to check out uh, the, the images that are used in the section, feel free. They're really pretty great, and I use them a lot. Your, uh, the, your communication and communication with your supervisors is really that primary form of transparency that you have. Um, some of the most, um, some of the hardest things to really overcome and one of the biggest barriers that I think a lot of people have to working remotely is that fear from a supervisor's position that you know, they won't know what their staff is doing. And from a staff position, I know for me it was a really big anxiety, you know, how do I prove to my supervisor that I'm actually working, um, that they know what I'm doing and that they don't think that, you know, and that they know that I'm hard at work and that I'm not, you know, sleeping in and um, just, you know, playing solitaire on my computer all day. And the real way that, you know, we do that and that I do that is uh, through, um, the communication that I provide to them um, and doing that reliably and often. I had this whole thought in my head when I first started working remotely that it was going to be great because I would have all this time, nobody would come into my office, nobody would interrupt me, and I'd have big blocks of time just to get work done. Um, in fact, for me at least, it's been kind of the opposite. Um, I definitely feel more calls and there are more kind of demands on my time. Um, our, our organization uses Slack as a, one of our primary, um, primary communication methods. And the number of sort of Slack pings I get, the number of things that I need to pay attention to in a channel, 
you know, is a lot. And it's one of the main ways that people know who's there, what's going on, and are able to kind of, you know, talk um, and keep tabs on each other throughout. So, you know, making sure that I have that kind of uh, communication with my supervisor and just other members of my team. I also supervise a couple of folks just doing on some individual projects and um, knowing that they have that, uh, that access to me as well is really important. Um, we also, um, also, you know, not being afraid of meetings. You know, we talk a lot and, you know, have really divergent thoughts on how impactful or effective meetings are. And in some ways, I do think that we need to kind of separate that out between, you know, what is the, what is the actual work that is getting done meeting to meeting? What are the decisions that are being made? How effective are those meetings? And when we do that analysis, we really also need to think about, about what the sort of intangible and the person costs are. Um, you know, meetings, even if it is just a quick 15 minute check in um, and there's nothing really to talk about, can for remote staff, and I know for me when I was first starting, are a really good way of just kind of sort of setting expectations and setting that um, that idea that we are going to work not only as a team but that we're going to interact with each other on a fairly regular basis. Um, video conferencing, especially when we're talking about those uh, those meetings, can be really important. Um, one of the things that I one of the things that I've really learned through uh, working remotely is that when we're when we don't see each other face to face, so much of the real communication gets lost. And I know for me, because I'm you know I'm here, I'm on my computer all the time. Um, written communication tends to start taking on a voice that may not be the one that's intended, um, and so it can lead to little more frustration sometimes, a little bit more anger sometimes. Um, it's never really been a huge issue, but just having that video conference, that face-to-face, -face, being able to see somebody's expression as you're checking in, as you're talking to them, can be really um, helpful and can really avoid some of those, you know, kind of pitfalls of, I read an email and that email is in all caps and it feels like somebody is yelling. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about meetings, when you're thinking about scheduling meetings, especially with staff, um, having the option to video conference, I think, can be really helpful um, and can be really important. Status messages, Slack just put in a status message um, option. I had used Google Hangouts before and that had for, or in Google Chat before then, and for a long time that had status messages. Those are really great. It allows me to just sort of put something up, say, hey, you know, I went out for a cup of coffee. I'll be right back. Um, it gives me a chance to say, I'll be back by a specific time. Um, so, you know, as a, so as that way of kind of being transparent, letting people know when I'm going to be where for how long, um, I think that that's really, uh, that's really helpful and can, you know, just cut down on some of that, just confusion. And then kind of going along with what we were talking about a little earlier with the video conferencing, you know, sort of assuming the best um, in, in all of your communication. Again, because we are working remotely, it is, I don't always know when, you know, someone on my team is, has come in and is tired from, you know, whatever happened the day before or, you know, is just generally in a bad mood. Those kinds of things that we would know if we worked in an office together, um, you know, are a little harder sometimes to suss out. And that is one of the barriers, um, you know, I think sort of when we talk about working remotely, it isn't for everyone. It's definitely something that's been really great for me. Um, but if you're the kind of person who really thrives off of, you know, kind of knowing everything that's going on in an office, being able to do that sort of interplay and that inner relationship with people, there are ways to get that. Um, but it's a little harder with, uh, with remote work. And so when I sit, so when, at least for me, I sit down, and really kind of look at my emails from the day, my Slack messages from the day, the various voicemails that I have, really, you know, assuming that everybody is, you know, kind of speaking the best, just assuming the best out of people and bringing that kind of kindness to, uh, to interrelationships, especially online, I think 
can be really, really important. And then just being clear. Um, you know, I have a, in, every time I compose an email or I'm writing up a document, for me, it's the passive voice that always sort of gets me. And so I have to be very careful about editing that out. Um, and just being kind of very clear about, you know, what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, um, because there's not always the chance to just pop in. Um, again, Slack allows a lot of that, but it is a little different, and it does take a little bit of a shift in, um, in thought process. And as part of that, sort of thinking about who does what and when and how and just having those clear and concise roles. Um, you know, again, it's really helpful to just know that, you know, what role you have in a project, what role you have in sort of an infrastructure, and for folks who are working remotely, kind of knowing that at the outset of the beginning of either, you know, your time as a remote employee or as projects come up, just knowing exactly what your role in that hierarchy can be can be really, really helpful. Um, and getting to know the team that you're on and not just, you know, knowing them um, in the way that I recognize their email, but really getting taking a chance and getting to know them, especially when we're talking about people who are internal to your organization. Um, one of the things that for, that for me personally, um, I just have to take a little bit more time to do is when I have a new, when we have a new member on our team or when I'm working with somebody who I haven't worked with before, um, is just to, you know, take that extra time, take that extra beat, um, and really ask, ask a follow up question, ask some more probing questions about my team members, um, and just to really kind of get to know them a little bit better. Um, there's no way, you know, again, there's not really a way to sit and have lunch sort of unstructured and just um, spontaneously with coworkers. It tends to be a little bit more structured and takes a little bit more of a conscious effort. It's well worth it and makes a lot of those processes much easier. And as a, you know, and one of the things that was really helpful for me when I started working remotely was to have um, a supervisor who who was aware of that and checked in, um, you know, and just sort of checked in about how those relationships were uh, were evolving. Um, and then just you know, again, kind of in that world of expectation setting, um, discuss when and how work will be con will be completed. Discuss that early. Discuss that often. We all have those projects that don't really have a timeline. Don't really have a deadline are kind of those as we get to them uh, sort of projects for remote workers. And for me, um, it was really important for me to kind of label that and to say, this is one of my rainy day projects, one of the projects that I don't have a deadline for. And when I do, when I review my projects, when I review all the various pieces that I have, being clear with others on my team about, you know, this is a project, I don't have a deadline for it, I'm just doing it as I'm able to do it. Um, is that still okay? Is that still the expectation? Um, can be a really helpful way to uh, real to think through sort of those projects and those deadlines. Just because we work remotely doesn't mean that we don't have that need for community and work community. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but one of the things that uh, really, you know, really happened for me and that I noticed a lot was that uh, my actual time doing work expanded when I started working remotely. Um, and so I'm spending actually more time doing work than I was uh, before I started working remotely. And that need for a work community in a space that I spend most of my time, that, that many of us spend most of our waking hours remains the same whether it's um, whether it's within an office or whether it's remote. So a couple of the things, um, meeting in person where when it's possible, um, you know, having those dedicated times and knowing those times early that, you know, somebody may be asked, hey, can you just come into the office for an afternoon? We have an all staff in service. We have an all staff training and we'd like you to come. Um, and just making sure that, you know, 
remote workers have as much of a opportunity to meet people in person as you know the in-person staff would have. Um, hanging out when you can. I, we Slack is again a really great, uh, a really great space. But other um, other sort of chat features have similar um, opportunities. We have you know a random channel where you know people just sort of post random things as they come as they come up. We have one that uh, is called the other screen where we talk about uh, movies or television shows that we've seen and that we like. Um, those kind of really specific um, abilities to get together over things that are not work related and to have those opportunities. And that, you know, as staff, we're not only, that's not only available, but that's also really encouraged. Um, the idea that, you know, going over to one of those other channels and spending five or 10 minutes talking about, you know, an episode of insert your favorite television show here. Mine right now is, Fra is uh, Grace and Frankie. Um, just being able to uh, just being able to talk about that and to know that my supervisors not only sort of know that I'm doing this, but really understand and feel like this is an important part of my day. And that might be different if you know your staff is not working 100% remote. That can definitely be changed and scaled. Um, to match those expectations, but just taking that into account can be really, um, really helpful. And that kind of covers that dedicated water um, water cooler space. And then the other piece, and this goes back to that hardware um, that uh, that Kat was talking about earlier. Um, sometimes both on our end, on my end as a staff person, but also on you know other folks' end when you're when I'm talking to people who are all in person. There are some kind of additional hardware considerations that just need to be thought through. Uh, the most annoying one and the one that we kind of get the most, um, the most sort of in, uh, play on this is when you have a group of people who are all meeting in a conference room around one poorly mic'd uh, laptop giving a presentation, which I as a remote staff half, I'm, I'm gonna listen to. If I can't hear it, if I can't hear the various people, if I'm not included in that, um, it can be very, very difficult to get everything that I would you know, need or want. So just thinking through you know, what, those, what those needs are and what changes need to be made. For me, I thought that you know, my original headset was gonna be enough, but I spend so much time on meetings and in calls that getting a really nice headset that had you know, some additional bells and whistles has made my life 100% better. Um, that's not something that I necessarily would have, you know, seen going into it, but definitely became really important. And also just sort of allows me to communicate and to participate in various meetings where it's both remote and in person. So supervision, and Allison's going to get into this, you know, in much in more depth than uh, than I will hear, but just, you know, clear expectations and goals on both sides. Um, you know, again, we'll talk about sort of supervising uh, remote workers, but for me as somebody who's being supervised, sort of coming in and really knowing and crystallizing what my expectations are out of supervision is really helpful and is really important. And for supervisors, if you're not asking your supervisees I think personally, both remote and in person, sort of what they want that role to look like, it's an interesting question to ask. Um, for me, you know, that idea of when, <clears throat> when should I expect my supervisor to jump in on an email or, you know, jump in on, you know, a thread that's happening in one of my other spaces can be really helpful just to know and to be very aware of. Um, regular check-ins, however it works, um, whether, you know, I have both sort of regular weekly check-ins um, as well as a email that I send about projects that I'm participating in and that I'm working on and what those statuses are. And that for me works really well. It helps me to kind of focus on both what I need to do in my own kind of world, lets my supervisor know what's happening, gives us a record of that, and then we can talk during our regular check-in session about what's actually going on and, 
and questions that I have without having to go over things that are just status checks. Um, but that may not work for you. Um, so whatever that kind of looks like, just setting that up and knowing what that looks like. And again, you know, meeting, video chat, I, video chats especially, I am not a huge video chat person, as you can tell, because I'm not on video chat now. Um, but, uh, you know, being able to, especially when we're talking about supervision, especially when there may be some, um, some hard conversations that, ha that may need to happen in supervision, um, being able to see somebody, being able to make eye contact is really, uh, really important. And then my mantra just generally for both supervision, but also for just remote work in general, is be consistent but flexible. Um, I find that as long as for me, I'm consistent about what I'm doing and I stay as flexible as I can because things happen. You know, my, I'm on a call and the fire alarm goes off in my building. You know, that can happen to every, to anybody, but things happen. Um, and so having both, you know, my own expectations be fairly consistent, but flexible based on what other people's needs are, um, and having the same expected out of me has been really, uh, really helpful. And then just project and case management generally, you know, consistency is really um, a key here. Just knowing what all of your pieces are, where everything is. Um, and that, you know, both for me, both my days as well as my work is, you know, kind of done with the same templates, the same tools, um, just ensuring that consistency across different projects. When I did case management, having, you know, a set of um, consistent sort of metrics for my cases, of forms for my cases that I used internally um, was really helpful and allows people to kind of, and allows other people who I'm working with some of the comfort of knowing where everything is, what's going on, and not feeling like they have to, you know, find all these various pieces and all these various uh, spaces um, that everything's kind of in one place and pretty streamlined and is consistent across the various projects that I'm working on. Um, ensuring and checking access to cloud-based tools, not just once, but over and over again, um, that that access sometimes changes. Um, you know, various various uh, tools install two-factor authentication when they didn't before. Stuff like that. Just making sure that those are um, that those are all together. And then balancing kind of shared management tools with personal ones. I mean, I have a um, you know, I have a notebook that I just keep all of my different notes, to dos, doodles, drawings. But knowing and being clear and having those expectations set out about what is in a notebook versus what is in the cloud. Um, you know, I am a firm believer that we're never going to get away from, you know, the scratch pad where I just write out what I need. Um, there's something very kind of human about that for me. Um, but making sure that at the end of the day, if something were to happen to me, that all that good information, all that necessary information is somewhere that's easily accessible. Um, and identifying what that information is can be really, really helpful. And now we're getting into like more of the kind of self-care piece. Um, so kind of identifying what works for you as a staff person. When I started um, working remotely, I had this whole thing, I was going to wake up early, I was going to have my coffee quietly, have some Zen time, and then I was going to pick up my email and start my day. Um, what that has turned into is I am in bed checking my email. Um, and sort of the trade-off for that for me is uh, I end my day, I'm on the West Coast, I work an East Coast schedule, so I end my day a little early. Um, you know, I'm able to take some time, and I've talked this through again with my supervisor, you know, I'm able to take some time in the middle of the day and run a few errands, straighten up the apartment, um, and that's, you know, self-care is not just doing things like going fishing, it's, you know, doing those things that are good and necessary for you to feel kind of sane and stable. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, but having a more fluid intermix of work and um, sort of self-care in a personal life has been really, really good for me personally. Um, other people hate it and, and don't want to do 
kind of what I do, which is fine. Um, and just communicating that with the team and just doing it um, and making sure that you have the time to do that. Um, isolation, and this is real for everyone, whether you work remotely or not. Um, there, I'm sure we can all think of times when working on a case or an important pleading and we look up and, I haven't, and you haven't seen anybody for three days. Um, that happens uh, for everybody. It, hap it is much easier for that to happen when you're in your apartment. Um, so, you know, just being aware, realizing when that happens. Um, and better hardware, like we were talking about before, can make working in a coffee shop, a library, a public place a little easier to, uh, to access. And finding lunch buddies or other ways to connect can really help with that as you're thinking through it. Um, co-working spaces, I'm, I live in San Francisco, there's a lot of them, but honestly, I've found the best co-working spaces have just been when I've put it out there on social media and said, hey, I need a place that's not my apartment to work, um, who wants to, you know, open up their home for a couple of hours and we can work together. I just need a quiet place. So don't think about co-working spaces necessarily as a structure, but more as just a place to be that is not your apartment. Um, and may, and has other people who are working as well, um, and that doesn't ha and that can be you know somebody's living room, and it's been actually a really great experience that's really helped me to refocus and be with others at the same time. And then overwork, um, you know, there for I think for as much as people worry about uh, pe about folks on their team not working enough, I think. There also needs to be a recognition that many of us and many of your team are going to work too much. Um, and so for me, sort of identifying, setting, and communicating my limits about how much work I can do, it is much harder because I don't think the people necessarily see how stressed out remote workers are because, again, we're not in the office. Um, and, you know, making sure that you hold yourself accountable or asking somebody to hold you accountable can be really helpful. Um, I have a couple of friends who just every time, you know, I get to a certain point, they're like, okay, Xander, you need to stop and let's go play in the sun. Um, and that's been really, really helpful and really great. So just something to think about. Again, you know, it's not just that your staff who work remotely aren't going to work enough. It's that oftentimes they may work too much um, and being aware and knowing those limits. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Allison. Great. Now, hopefully, my phone didn't flip out. Can everybody hear me? Yep, yes, we can. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, this is I'm Allison Paul. I'm the executive director of Montana Legal Services Association, and I was amused when I went to prepare for this to realize that I had done this almost this exact same talk ten years ago for LSN Tap, and so I look back at my notes from 2008, and they were as relevant today as they were then. Um, so I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, I always like to start when I talk about this subject to define what remote supervision is because I think what most legal aid programs don't realize is they are doing it. They have people that work remotely in every program. They might not be working from home, but they're working from a different physical location than the supervisor. Um, and the next slide has a few examples. So it could be, um, you know, supervision of a staff member who works from home, which is a lot of what we've been talking about today. It could also be just a senior attorney with expertise in a subject matter supervising staff in another office. Um, supervision of a circuit writing attorney here in Montana, that's a term we use a lot because we have people that uh, ride out, that ride meaning get in a car. No, we don't have horses. They get in a car and drive out to um, rural locations to deliver services. But I can't see them working. Um, just like I can't see somebody when they're at home. And then the other one is, you know, most executive directors supervise managing attorneys in field offices. That's all remote supervision. And all of the stuff that, you know, Xander was talking about in terms of communication, it's all equally applicable, I think, to all of these situations. Um, and so that to, to, that's a setup for what is the program attitude about remote supervision. And some programs are particularly excited 
Um, but this picture is my daughter who um, her brother placed her on top of some logs on a sled and pushed her down a hill. And as you can see by the look at her face, she just kind of knew it was going to happen. <laughs> um, and that is kind of the way that I think some, some programs approach remote supervision and remote work thinking, well, I'm just going to have to let staff do it. And I don't want to, I don't think they're going to work, but it's the way of the future. Um, but I don't think it has to be that way. Um, at our program, we embrace it and embrace it within um, the idea that there has to be good communication and good expectations. So some of the challenges that I think every program has, um, and somebody alluded to this earlier, how do you really know the employee is working? Um, you know by their work product. Um, that's how you know. Either clients are getting represented or they're not. Um, projects are getting accomplished or they're not. Um, in the same way that somebody on the other side of my office, I don't know if they're playing solitaire, um, and I honestly don't want to know. Um, if they're getting their work done, I don't really care. Um, you know, how do you track productivity without micromanaging? And I've got a few tools that are coming up in some slides, but that's, you know, that's always a challenge. You want to be able to set clear goals for people and, and, and have them meet them. And a lot of times in the legal aid culture, we aren't, we aren't set up around work plans and goals, and it's hard to come up with a, you know, to think about moving your program to that so that you can track pro productivity without having to know every single thing the person is doing. Um, you know, another way we track productivity without micromanaging is through all our supervisors review time. I mean, when you're looking at that, you can tell what somebody's working on. If you have a case handler who is, supposed to be spending 60 to 70 percent of their time handling cases and you look at their timesheets repeatedly and they've only got 20 percent in handling cases that's a conversation about why that's happening um, we also use our calendars a lot um, to track um, and that it's a huge tool we use google calendar um, everyone is required to put at the top as an all-day entry what your work hours are because everyone has different work hours so whether you're working on site or off site um, like mine are 8.30 to 5. Um, and that's just up there so people have a good expectation. And then if I'm going to be gone, that's clearly marked and everybody can see everybody else's calendar. And it's a huge communication tool for setting expectations around, um, you know, remote work and productivity. Um, and then I think the other, and, and Xander talked about it, this a lot, a, a challenge is encouraging collaboration and communication between on-site and off-site employees. And I think all programs have this if you have multiple offices. How do you get those offices to work together and have, you know, assume the best about each other? Um, and I think there's a bunch of different tools that you can use to do that, um, both in how you communicate, what you use to communicate, um, and what expectations you have about that communication. Next slide. So we have a bunch of different policies, and there are about seven tools that I sent to Brian. I know he could only put four of them in the handout section. Um, but these are things that we use and that we've found useful over time in helping promote um, the idea of remote work and remote supervision. Um, the first one is our remote work policy and request form. And we develop, we actually have been allowing people to work from home for years, um, but it became clear to me that we actually needed to write it down so people knew they could do it. because so some people wanted to do it and weren't asking. Um, and there were two different, we wanted to force them to think through the, the, the things involved in remote work. Like, do you, what's your work environment like? Do you have a, a private place to work if you're doing client work? Um, do you have, um, you know, if you're gonna do it on a occasional basis, do you have the right equipment? And what's your internet like? We ask all those questions and then we ask them to think through what they want. The policy contemplates that there could be two types. There could be occasional work when I just need to work from home from time to time. And we actually wanna know that because of the computer security issues. I wanna know if one of my staff attorneys is working at home and I wanna educate them on, on what that means. Um, and then we do have some people that, that work remotely um, most of the time. And, and that's a different request. You know, and it's funny, I have not had an explosion since we actually adopted a policy, um, but it has forced people to communicate around wanting to work from home um, and why, which has been great um, and helped with our, secure, our computer security stuff. Um, the other thing I'll say is I have had, I did have somebody recently ask if they could work from home every day so they could be home after school with their kids and their kids were fairly young. 
and I and they and there it was a person who does client work um, and we said no you know occasionally if you want to be at home because your kids are off school in the afternoon and you need to be there and you can structure your work but if if your job is is having to do confidential work and you have small children at home the, and, and you would be their primary caregiver that's not what this is for um, so it, you can put limits around it for programs that are worried about about that um, as long as you're consistent and um, the next thing just, up is the just part, for a quick yep. clarification um, there we will take um, all seven of those policies and we will make them available on the website and also along with the video we'll also uh, try to email them out to participants we have four of them up um, currently downloadable, the MLSA computer use policy, uh, the MLSA implementation uh, guide for email computer use policy, the progress report, examples for remote supervision, and the sample hire letter for remote employees are all in that handout section, and the others will be available after the webinar. Thanks, Brian. So the computer use policy is is our version of a bring your own device policy. We just wrapped it all into one. We don't have a separate one that talks about bring your own device and it talks about a lot of the things that um, Kat and Anna touched on earlier. Um, the next two policies listed here um, are actually from the old NTAP. NTAP, some of you may know, used to be a standalone organization with a virtual staff before Northwest Justice Project and Brian. Um, these are still, I think, really valid. They had developed electronic communication protocols um, for how they should communicate as a staff and what you should use, and a protocol for getting started as a virtual employee that I thought was pretty great. Um, so we've, I've included those in your materials. They're, like I said, they're a little bit dated, so some of the technology it talks about might not be current, um, but the principle and what you should cover is, is all still really valid. Next slide. And then these are some other tools that I've I've provided to you guys, and it, it's I do have it under the column of setting expectations because I think it's really important to set expectations for staff who are going to be working remotely or or supervised remotely. Um, and and in there is a sample hiring letter for an offsite worker, and that's also from NTAP. Um, and what they would use to go through a whole bunch of different things that you would think about that maybe you wouldn't think about in a standard hiring letter. Um, there's a sample progress report for an offsite worker. This was actually developed by um, Kate Blado, and maybe a couple people on this phone call know of Kate. She worked for Pro Bono Net for a while. But I supervised her, and she worked out of um, her home in Maryland. And she came up with a, um, this was her own invention. It's, she's incredibly detailed, so you'll see it's incredibly detailed. But as a communication tool, it was fantastic because I knew what she did that week. I knew what she planned to do. I knew kind of the status of her projects all on one quick sheet of paper that I could quickly look at. It saved us both time. Um, I'm also a, a huge promoter of regular check-ins. Um, I think making sure with any staff you supervise, but in particular remote staff, having regular check-ins, um, using video conferencing, all of our staff that have almost all of our staff have video cameras and headsets and we have a go to meeting account that everyone can use um, that works for, that works really well for just meeting with people about your work um, we encourage all our supervisors to use it i think it's been adopted in varying levels of success um, i use it with people so they get used to it with me um, so i think that's 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 important for the management to set an example that this is you know, once you get used to seeing yourself on camera, it's a little, it becomes less daunting. And it's really important to be able to see people that you aren't physically in the same place as. Um, a tool that I think is really helpful for setting expectations, but which is not included, because um, I couldn't find one quickly, was a just a work plan. And I think there's all kinds of work plan format, formats uh, posted on the Management Information Exchange Library, um, which lots of legal aid programs have a membership to. Um, but just having a good, clear work plan with your staff so you set expectations around what you expect them to accomplish so you know, you know, to to judge that productivity by in a fair way. Um, I think that's important. And then I think making sure that your staff has access to some sort of collaboration software. Um, there's a million different kinds from the Google suite um, 
We at Montana Legal Services use um, something called iMeet Central, which used to be called Central Desktop, um, or anything that allows you to, to communicate and collaborate in a web-based environment so that it's more like you're sitting across the desk from somebody. I think that's really important for managing remote workers. And then I think when you're thinking about hiring remote workers, it's important to look for particular qualities. And these are some things, um, and these all touch on, Xander and I actually didn't coordinate completely around what we were going to talk about. Um, but this all echoes, I think, what he was talking about. Um, that you want to look for people who, who take initiative when something needs doing. I mean, these are things you probably want in staff too, but, but different people work at different speeds and need, need more, more direction or less direction. Um, I think you want somebody who has work that is portable, and most of our work these days is portable, um, but we have, you know, like our intake workers, we don't have them working remotely for a variety of reasons. Um, and we have a few, you know, the front desk receptionist probably doesn't have work that is portable to work from home. Um, people are highly organized and able to set own boundaries and priorities. That's huge. And as Xander talked about, it's important to set by boundaries with your personal life so you don't burn out. Um, people who don't mind working in isolation um, sometimes. Um, people who don't need much immediate supervision and feedback. Um, so thinking about, is this somebody that constantly wants to touch base with you and needs to do that in person or even remotely? Or can they work independently for long stretches of time? Um, and then are effective communicators in writing and by phone. And that, that is really huge because while it's, it's really important to stick face-to-face -face meetings in, um, it's not going to happen all the time just because of time. And so you want people who can be an effective communicator in writing when you're doing things by email um, or by chat. And I echo Xander's um, that it's really important to have some mechanism for chat. We use Novell Messenger, which allows us to have statuses as well. In fact, as Xander was talking, I realized I hadn't put my status on webinar, so nobody would interrupt me. Um, and it's a good way, like I work from home, um, you know, at least one day every couple of weeks. And, you know, I put on my status working from home so people know they can't walk down the hall and find me. Um, they have to call me. Um, and if I'm at lunch, I put I'm at lunch so that they know I'm not just, you know, watching TV with my feet on the coffee table. Although I might be doing that while having lunch. Thanks, Allison. Um, I think that actually is really interesting what you said about how uh, you gave this almost 10 years ago. I think that <laughs> says something for um, <laughs> the progress in the area. I think it's funny that I'm still talking about it, and I am happy to talk about it with anybody. So if anybody wants to reach out directly, although I have to say I am going on sabbatical for three months, so you'd have to wait till August. But that said, I'm really happy to talk about this with any program. So we're going to wrap up real quick with some lessons learned um, in each of these perspectives. And uh, if there's any questions, we can address those. So as far as technology goes, um, I've only been working remotely for since January. Um, and just really kind of, I think this touches on almost all three pieces, not just the technology, but making a good, comfortable workspace that feels like you're in um, your office at work or feels like you are in a in a, a space where you can be productive is really important um you know if you are somebody who wants from home really i know you know resources are often limited in legal aid programs but really kind of engaging your supervisor or your technology staff whoever's making the decisions on having um, quality uh, hardware so you are able to have um, to do quality work and making sure that that your hardware and software and access to them are not hindering your ability to do your work. Um, Kat, any other technology lessons to add? Well, um, in terms of not only the computer hardware being technology, if you look at my beautifully clean office on the right, um, you will see that, you know, it's, it's also the technology of your workspace. And, you know, some of us are, this is not my actual desk. Um, some of us are messier than others, but if I can live with my mess and find the things that I need to, that's fine. But if things are overflowing and I can't even reach my mouse, um, that's an important consideration. 
Also, one thing that we, all of us who've worked from home and remotely, um, as Xander touched on earlier, plan B, plan C, plan Q, plan Z. Um, always have, if possible, always have more than one laptop or device that can connect. Um, and, you know, be prepared to have to reschedule something on the fly because the fire alarm is going off or because you can't connect to go to a meeting or because the Con Edison electric guy out front just cut the electricity to your building for a whole day, um, which ha has happened to me, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank This is Allison again. I'll talk really quickly about some lessons from a management perspective. Um, I think d do not underplay the importance of paying attention to on-site versus off-site dynamics and avoid burnout and isolation of off-site workers. Um, recently, we we were doing a project group working together was doing a, a video conferencing meeting and I made everybody sit at their computer and connect by video for the reason Xander mentioned, which is when you have four or five people in the same office and two people connecting just by video or remotely, it's the dynamics get all skewed because the people that are sitting in the room together obviously are going to have side conversations or all kinds of things. When you force everybody to participate either by phone or by video, ideally, you can still all see each other, but even though somebody's down the hall from me, you know, they said, oh, well, why am I? This seems really silly. And I said, well, it's because I want everybody to feel a part of this meeting. Right? We are all equally valuable, not just the people who are physically together. Um, and I think paying attention to that in all of your interactions and how that works and how email trails work and how, you know, all that, all that stuff is really important. Um, I think it's really important to set expectations of your supervisors that are supervising people that are working remotely. You know, we expect you to do regular check-ins. We expect you to use video conferencing and pay attention you know, to, to workload and productivity in the ways that aren't micromanaging. Um, and we have, we're, we're actually, we're, we're famous as a program for actually not writing things down, but just doing them. So we're working on writing down our supervision expectations, but we definitely have them and communicate them on a regular basis. Um, so when I get those written down, I'm happy to share those. Um, you know, encourage use of video conferencing and face-to-face -face meetings. And then I do think remote work is an inevitable shift for all of our programs. I think, I think if you want to attract the best talent in the new generation of workers, they want to be able to work from a coffee shop as appropriate or work from home. Um, I think it helps you attract and retain the best staff. And I think it allows all kinds of opportunities for new partnerships. We have some new remote workers that are placed at domestic violence shelters and tribal court offices around the state that work by themselves. I mean, they're really a remote worker, um, but they're within a social service agency atmosphere. That's not a new concept in the legal aid world. Um, but I think people don't think about that as being a remote worker that all these same things apply to and you need to pay attention to. And finishing us off, Sander? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of this um, kind of piggybacks off of what other folks have said, you know, being transparent, sort of knowing your strengths um, as a uh, as a remote worker, you know, knowing what is going to take me a little bit more time maybe to communicate to my supervisor or to, you know, or to do and just take that into account. Um, setting my limits and but being flexible around those limits, you know, not all of our limits are things that we can uh, that we can achieve every time um, adjusting your expectations I you know chuckled when I saw you know both the desks that in the slide deck um, when I first started working remotely I had sort of this expectation that I was going to have you know a separate place to work um, and in reality I live in a 400 square foot studio apartment and so you know everything's all together but being able to kind of adjust that and still get my needs met and kind of be flexible around that is uh, is really important. And then, you know, two that we don't talk about a lot, um, getting healthy snacks. I'm home all the time. Um, so being able to, you know, my current uh, go-to are roasted chickpeas and clementine oranges. Um, but, you know, having something there, if you do work remotely, you know this uh, this problem. Um, so, you know, having those and then again, kind of echoing a couple of things earlier, we don't always have the chance to, um, you know, to interact with people on a regular basis. We don't always have a chance to see what other people are, um, 
are, look like and are communicating to us non-verbally when we work remotely. And oftentimes we do it in a lot of isolation. Um, so just remembering to kind of be kind, to cut other people uh, slack that, you know, that last email of the day where you just read it and you're like, I can't, I just cannot, you know, shut it down, leave, come back to it later. Um, and I think that that's really helpful on both sides. So those are my, uh, that's mine. And then these uh, kind of life lessons, just all wrapping it all up, right? Uh, Xander hit on a lot of these. Um, so again, just important to, and it's important to have these conversations with your staff who are going to be working remotely. Um, you know, I wish I could take a little snippet of Xander's talk earlier and kind of package it to be given to anybody who ever asks to work remotely, because I think it's really, really, uh, useful. So make sure, you know, you're having those conversations uh, with your staff um, if, if you're moving to a more remote workforce. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Brian, are there any uh, questions in the question queue? Um, we've got one here. Um, so one thing is here that um, it's important for attorneys to look at their lo local ethics rules regarding um, internet use and email use. Technology use uh, seems to be a frequent issue in CLEs. Um, I definitely agree with what Trent is saying here. Um, and actually look at not only what's being said in CLEs, but whatever the actual ethics opinions are. Um, I have attended several um, CLEs that have been very well intended, uh, but did not reflect what local rules say here in Washington State. There is a lot of fear uh, in this area, and it's important to try to get past that and look at what the best practices are uh, for security, for safety, those type of things. So unfortunately, there is some misinformation out there also. Uh, it can definitely be done safely in a way that protects clients. Um, interests and their private information. Yes, excellent. Great point. Thank you, Brian. Well, thank you so much for putting this on. We greatly appreciate it. It's a very important topic. Northwest Justice Project just implemented a uh, remote work policy and has individuals that are navigating this right now. This has been very, very timely for us. Um, this has been the first webinar uh, that we've done with uh, Just Tech. Uh, there will be a survey coming out afterwards. We would appreciate any feedback as part of that. Um, also a reminder to download the handouts that are there and we'll make the other two handouts available both on the blog post and on the video uh, through YouTube. There is a link in the chat um, to our YouTube channel there and also to all of the other trainings for this year. We have over 20 more free trainings coming up. Find the ones that are interesting to you and we hope to see you there. If you've got future questions, please feel free to uh, email us at lsntap.org uh, and We've got a help desk function. Myself and Kat are happy to do research and help connect you with somebody in the community that can help you with any issues related to this. Thank you to all the presenters also. I greatly appreciate it. You brought in some wonderful experts today. Thanks so much, Brian. Thanks, everybody.